Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for honoring the trust. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick up pace quite a bit because the first, I tell you the truth, I mean, I, I um, speaking maybe a bit slower than I planned, so now I'm going to make up for it and speak uh, double speed. Hopefully, we can still uh, uh, get much out of this. And I think that maybe many of you have seen this before. So the thing is that we have this view of uh, what we talked so far is this view that looks at uh, uh, capacity, an inductive bias or capacity control in terms of the network, and particularly the size of the network is what we have here. And um, what we, uh, in the hypothesis class is, you know, functions we can fit with a neural net. Um, and then uh, about uh, seven years ago already, eight years ago almost, we did some experiments that for me at least uh, really uh, changed the way I, I think of many of these things. Uh, and so even though many of you probably have seen this uh, plot before, I'm actually curious, how many of you have seen this plot before? Know what's hidden here? Okay, how many, who hasn't seen this plot before? Nobody, or oh, nobody, one person, okay. I'm still gonna present it because I, I mean, this really has been uh, uh, for me at least very significant. So the experiment we did that apparently many of you have already heard uh, about we fit uh, um, networks. So this is work with the uh, Benham Nation Board and uh, Ryoto Tomioka. We fit networks of uh, different sizes uh, to data. I mean, this is, I don't remember either CIFAR or MNIST. This is MNIST dating data. And what we looked at is the training error and the test error. And I want to emphasize that this is not like, you know, talked about x axis, this is not runtime, right? So this is not like over a single run, right? So every network we fit completely separately. We took a network with 18 units, with 16 units, with, you know, 512 fitting units, and with each network we completely fit it from scratch. And what can we see is two things. Well, first of all, the training error goes down. That's not surprising at all. And the more interesting thing is what happens to the test error, right? And the test error initially goes down, right? And this is not surprising because you know we 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 the network is bigger and bigger. We have better fit. You know the estimation error is improving. That's great. The interesting thing is what happens past this point. So in 64 the units, the net the network is uh, the the hypothesis class is big enough to completely fit the data. There's essentially no estimation error. Okay. And the question is now um, how the test error is going to behave. And the classic theory, based on what uh, uh, Spencer told us uh, yesterday is now we're gonna talk about uh, uh, larger and larger classes. Our approximation error is not going uh, down. Sorry, so before there's no approximation error. That is no estimation error, sorry. You can, um, there's no approximation error. So now we're gonna start suffering the effects of the estimation error and um, things are gonna get much worse. Okay, so we're gonna, the error could increase. In fact, with a thousand hidden units, there's already uh, more parameters here than uh, data points which means I can fit anything I can like learn. I mean, the, the error here should actually be not like just like this, but like completely through the roof should be as bad as the null error, maybe even worse. Um, but if I'm showing you this, you already know that this is not what actually gonna happen in practice. And many of you have seen this before. And what we see is actually behavior that looks like this, okay? So now what's going on here? So, and again, I mean, when we first saw this, this was, you know, we had to scratch our eyes several times. And, and even though this kind of matches what we, empirically see uh, uh, in realistic situations training neural networks, you know, we train larger and larger networks without any explicit regularization. So the only capacity control here is like with the size of the network. And yet the error, and it must be the estimation error here is going down. The test error is going down, okay? Um, and, and this is very strange. There are many things that are strange here. The fact that it's going down and not, you know, first of all, it's not, you know, going up, it's even going down. But then again, let's focus on this like uh, point here uh, where there's, you know, a thousand uh, units. And over here, um, our classic theory is going to tell us that we can generalize it all because the capacity of the class is too large, right? That we have more, you know, can shatter anything. We can fit different random labels. There's absolutely no way we can, uh, we can generalize. And yet uh, the network we find does actually generalize. So, so what's going on here? And the thing is that, as I tell you, at this point, we're really, um, there are more parameters in data points. So the, 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 mo the model is underdetermined, right? So just saying all we did here was we find the empirical risk minimizer, right? We minimize the training error. And we know we found the global minimum of the training error. How do I know that I found the global minimum of the training error, even though I'm just doing local search? I don't know that it's a global minima. Zero, right? I mean, it's, the objective is not negative. And I found something with zero error, right? So it's definitely a global minima. Um, but the thing is that there are many global minima. There are many ways of getting a zero error solution, okay? And in fact, what I'm gonna plot here, each one of these points um, corresponds to a zero training error solution. So all of these are valid global minima, okay? And somehow the global minima um, that we found um, actually uh, uh, does generalize well, okay? 
So why is it that the global minima that we find actually generalizes as well, even though it's definitely possible to get lots of different global minima? Another way, so later on there's another experiment that you probably have already seen and also in some sense observed uh, another phenomena, it observed the same phenomena, uh, and now instead of just believing me that there, there's enough parameters, they actually check that there's enough parameters to fit everything. So this is the, the uh, oops, getting truncated a bit here, but what was over there? Okay, over there, it's fine. Uh, oops, go back, go back. Um, this is an experiment by uh, uh, Zhang et al. And what they did is they looked at networks and they said, okay, these have many parameters, but let's even convince ourselves that really we can shatter. They just empirically shattered, right? So they took um, uh, random labels and they saw that with these same architectures, we can get actually completely fit random labels. They get 100% or near 100% accuracy in random labels. So you know that with this hypothesis class, we can shatter. And yet, uh, when you fit, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, when you fit on real data, um, okay, also get 100% uh, accuracy, zero error. That's not surprising because we can say we can always get 0%, uh, zero error, but you actually also generalize well. You get uh, high accuracy, okay? Of course, with random labels, you know, you keep, then you, there's no way of getting high accuracy, high test accuracy, okay? So what's going on here? And then the, the conclusion here, well, this is impossible. How can we have a learning rule? How can we have a learning rule that on one hand can shatter anything, can get zero training error always, even in random labels. On the other hand, can generalize well, okay? So, um, and this doesn't fit, uh, in some sense, doesn't fit this, uh, the view that Spencer uh, presented, at least not if you think of uh, this ERM uh, over a class. But is this possible? So, so let's think again of what happens here. Does this mean that we have to like, you know, again, this is you know, reminding you the theme of this, uh, the second half of the tutorial is what do we need to rethink and what do we already know? Like, is this something we need to rethink? or is this fits perfectly fine with our understanding, right? So what's the phenomena here? Let's summarize it. We, we see that we have a learning rule, right? Training the network um, that on one hand can shatter anything. Like on any data set, even with random labels, it can get zero training error. On the other hand, if it's actually uh, the, the training data is real data actually comes from reality, then okay, we also get zero training error because we always get zero training error, but it also generalizes well. Okay, can we have such a learning rule? Okay. And the answer is, of course, yes. Okay, we're used to having such a learning rule. Maybe the, the simplest example is one nearest neighbor, right? So one nearest neighbor, by definition, we always get zero training error, right? Because every point in the training set is its own neighbor. So we always get zero training error. And yet we have results that under some mild assumptions, if the data actually does come from some reality that has some like mild continuity assumptions, we know that the test error will actually go to zero, right? So again, so we always get zero training error even on random labels. But if the data, the important thing here is if the data satisfies some reasonable assumptions, then we also get uh, a small test error. Okay, so this is not like by itself something special, but this is with one nearest neighbor, which doesn't really feel like what we're doing here because we're doing something more like ERM. So can we get something also with like this rule where we just minimize something? And also that is something that uh, we're used to. And it's enough to think about something like hard margin SVM. So what's a hard margin SVM learning rule? So for hard margin SVM, with a think of hard margin SVM with a universal kernel, like a Gaussian kernel. So you have Gaussian kernel SVM. And with hard margin SVM, we always insist on getting, on separating uh, the data and we just find the maximum margin separator. So the thing is that with a Gaussian kernel, I can always separate the data, right? So any, any finite uh, set of points is separable with a Gaussian kernel, right? So everything is separable. Um, so even with random labels, I would always get zero trading error. But the thing is that we also know that if actually reality is uh, uh, captured by a low norm predictor, so there is actually a low, high margin, which means low norm predictor uh, that, uh, uh, that captures reality, then I will also generalize. Okay, so again, exactly this type of phenomenon. So let's think of it from the perspective of what we uh, talked about in terms of complexity measure and, and, uh, and these sublevel sets and the capacities. So what's going on here, we're training a hard margin SPM, we're looking for the minimum, no, maximum margin, which is the same as minimum norm predictor that fits the, the, the data. So if data is generated by some reality here that has small norm, okay, then the minimum norm uh, predictor is gonna be you know, of, of that size. And the relevant sublevel set of the complexity measure, kind of what I, the, the relevant capacity, uh, the, the set I have to measure its capacity is something like this. And this can be small and I'm gonna generalize. What's gonna happen when I fit, um, Random labels, so random labels are not like, I cannot fit them, you know, in order to, to fit them, I really have to use a huge, a very high norm predictor, a very complicated predictor, okay? So I can actually fit them, uh, but I'm gonna have to go way, you know, they're much more complicated, you know, they're like, you know, as complicated, you know, they're 
I have to go to capacity proportion to the number of points, okay? Uh, and so the relevant level, sublevel set is huge, and I'm not going to generalize. Okay, so again, so our, 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 as we said, our theory is still valid. We still just need to understand the capacity of each uh, set. But the thing is that the, the, the relevant hypothesis class, the relevant sublevel set that we have to look at its capacity is not fixed and predetermined, but rather it corresponds to whatever it is that fits the, the data, right? So, um, and this is something, and this is nothing new here. This um, uh, goes back to the at least 90s, if not before, and it's something we understand very well, okay? Uh, is this uh, questions about this? This is, I think, uh, okay, yes. Yeah, so that's sorry, that's the example of what I uh yeah, definitely, and that's that's exactly what we uh oh yeah, the answer is yes, and I'll show you this in a second. Okay. Uh okay, good. Uh, um okay, so as we see, there's nothing like special about the fact that we have a learning rule on one hand that's zero training error, and the other hand uh generalized as well when and only generalize as well of course when reality is simple right so if reality is gonna <coughs> how well it generalizes depends on reality um so this is for uh um i said for a hard margin svm we can also see it even in my favorite learning rule which i already mentioned before which is the shortest program again this is maybe not implementable but i think conceptually it really is the um, uh, if somebody asks, you know, what's the measure of simplicity? Maybe this even Matush would agree that the kind of universal measure of simplicity is just, you know, the length of a of a program needed to uh, uh, to explain uh, the data. You agree with that, Matush? You're happy. Even Matush is happy with that, right? And so this is, in some sense, maybe the prototypical learning rule. It's of course completely unimplementable. But if you think of the learning rule that just outputs the shortest program that gets zero error for any any labels, even random labels, I always have a program that gets zero training error, right? That just encodes all the training set. Uh, it might be very long, right? But if reality is actually captured by, by can be captured by a small program, then we, I know I'm also gonna generalize, right? So again, this is not uh, special. So let's go back to here. And um, we said that we find a, a global minima that actually has zero, uh, that actually generalize well. And going back to, what's your name? Well, going back to Armin's question, um, there are, uh, uh, um, and so, um, so, uh, so it's not uh, really surprising here, but then the thing is that there are actually also many uh, global minima here that have horrible test error, right? So all of these points correspond to global minima of the test error, uh, global minima of the training error, and they have horrible test error. They don't generalize well. So why is it that our predictor generalizes well, the predictor we found generalizes well, whereas all these other ones don't generalize well? Okay. How do you find those? Ah, how do I find these? That's much harder to find them, actually. Uh, so the way we found them is we in, we optimized the training error and uh, also having high error and another a random set of examples, we call them the confusion set. Okay, so intentionally very, and it, this optimization is much harder, actually. I mean, it is much, much harder to optimize. Um, but we succeeded in actually finding them. I mean, we know theoretically they exist. They're most global minima are like this, but it's actually much harder to find them. Okay, yeah. Sure. If I ignore the exact x axis, yeah. then plots like this were also there in the earlier boosting literature. Right? Yeah. So I'm very curious what your thoughts are on like what is new that's happening here. Nothing. Okay. okay. <laughs> but but it's, it's in the context of. Yeah, so, 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 so what I'm saying is this is we, we didn't, you know, this plot for us, it was new for neural networks, but it's very similar. Okay, it's a bit. Um, we can maybe. I think the first order answer is nothing. There are some differences, but you're right. You're right that uh, that's um, a surprise. You're right that plots like this were definitely observed also for. Uh, this is not the first time we kind of for uh, seeing something like this in scratch in our head. You know exactly for the for the same reason. Okay, but let's let's go back to here. And what's uh, uh, happening here is that it seems that maybe the the um, the reason we're generalizing we said in SVM the reason we're generalizing is you know there are many also there are many ways of getting zero error and we're choosing the one which has smallest norm okay and maybe that's also what's happening here okay and so in that case this x-axis which is number of hidden units and I said uh, the the theme here is watch the x-axis doesn't actually measure our real complexity measure okay and in fact already uh, back in the 90s um, Peter Bartlett pointed out that uh, for uh, maybe when we talk about supergeneralization in neural networks, similar to SVMs, 
what the more relevant complexity measure is not the number of hidden units, but maybe some measure of the norm. Okay. And you didn't ask me here, I asked you to always ask me what's an x axis. And you know, prior, maybe you didn't ask me what's an x axis here. Right. So I told you what's an y axis, and I plotted many global minima. But the what I plotted in the x axis here is also some measure of norm. Okay. It's some specific norm that I don't want to get into, it's called the path norm. Uh, that makes this plot nice. Um, but the point is that indeed these uh, uh, predictors that uh, are very bad, okay, the, um, also have very uh, high norm. Whereas the predictor that generalizes as well is a predictor with small norm. Okay? Um, so, uh, uh, so, so this suggests that maybe the relevant complexity measure here, what we're really doing is not just you know, finding a predictor by, by a low norm predictor. But the first question here is which norm? Okay? So, you can think about uh, you know in, in uh, um, you can think about norm that you think of norm you think of some squares of all the weights in the system some kind of Frobenius norm I can tell you that if I plotted that and the, the reason I didn't plot that on the x-axis here is it didn't look so would not look so nice okay um, so the path norm is some other norm that I don't want to even tell you what it is because I know it's not the right answer but it does like make this plot nice you can think of many other measures of magnitude of, of the weights many other norms okay. Um, if we're saying that the, the real uh, complexity measure here is not number of units, it's some kind of uh, magnitude-based measure, what, is, what measure, what norm? But more than that, we should ask, you know, how, you know, why are we actually, how are we minimizing this norm or complexity measure, whatever it is? Because what we did here, you know, is just find, uh, just minimize the training error. All we did is taking this class and minimizing the, the, the training error. And we did minimize it. We find a global minima. But as we said, all of these are valid global minima. But somehow our learning algorithm, which was just gradient descent, returned to us not just a global minima, but returned to us a good global minima. I want to say good. This is really being unfair to the algorithm because all of these are also completely valid global minima. But somehow the algorithm chose not to return them, but to return one that has maybe small norm or something like this. Okay, so how is this happening? Is this kind of a, a, again, is this a new and strange thing? How can the algorithm, without being told so, actually not only minimize the error, but also return something that's simple in some sense? Okay. So again, this is not something that's newer. We have to, oh, uh, um, uh, okay. um, not something that's new. We have to go very far. And you know, whenever there's something you want to understand, you should always you know, uh, start with a simplest possible model that has this uh, phenomena and the simplest possible model is frequently just uh, least squares, right? linear least squares. Okay, so let's look at the linear least squares problem. And I wanna uh, solve this uh, under parameterized linear least squares, right? Oh, um, sorry, over parameterized, underdetermined linear least squares. Remember, we're talking about le learning underdetermined models where there are many, many more parameters than data points. So that's what we're gonna look at here. We're gonna look at a least squares problem with many, many more dimensions than equations or data points, okay? So it's very easy to optimize this. There are many, uh, many global minima, right? There are many ways to get zero error solution, right? There's a whole like uh, M minus D, sorry, D minus M dimensional uh, space of uh, solutions. But if I optimize this with gradient descent, which of these many solutions am I gonna get to? What's the answer? So what happens if I optimize this with gradient descent? So I'm gonna get the minimum Euclidean norm solution, okay? Um, and, um, and the thing is, that note that I didn't actually ask gradient descent to find the minimum Euclidean norm solution. Okay, and the fact, and also the fact that I'm looking at minimum Euclidean norm is not part of the optimization problem. This optimization problem is nothing to do with the minimum Euclidean norm. Okay, you might be confused because there is actually Euclidean norm here, but that's actually relevant. I'll get the same thing also if I replace this Euclidean norm with an L1 norm of the error. I'd still gradient descent would still converge to the minimum Euclidean norm solution. The choice of this Euclidean norm is purely a function of the optimization algorithm. If I change the optimization algorithm for the exact same optimization problem, I'm actually gonna be Im implicitly minimizing some other norm. So in particular, if instead of using gradient descent, I use uh, coordinate descent, okay, so, so I optimize the exact same underdetermined problem, use coordinate descent, what am I which, which predictor am I gonna converge to now? I'm also gonna converge to a zero error predictor, but which zero error predictor? Am I also gonna converge to the minimum Euclidean norm predictor? Okay, not quite, okay. So it's gonna be related to the minimum L1 norm, but it's not gonna be exactly minimum L1 norm. It's gonna be, basically it's gonna be the Lars predictor, which we know the Lars is kind of similar to this. So it's not exactly the same, oh, okay. It's definitely not gonna be the minimum Euclidean norm predictor, okay? Okay, um, and so we see that uh, what we're seeing here is that we're getting a, a very significant in, uh, inductive bias, a very significant bias towards simplicity 
And this bias to its simplicity is coming purely from the optimization algorithm, not from the not from our formulation of the optimization problem. If we change the optimization problem algorithm, right, we get a different uh, simplicity measure. Okay, this is for a uh, for a least score solution. Um, and note that here it's also a bit difficult. You know, here it's actually uh, um, easy to understand uh, to characterize what we get um, for coordinate descended already, which is like this. You know, the simplest possible thing is gradient descent. The same, second uh, simplest optimization algorithm is coordinate descent. It already becomes a bit tricky to to exactly characterize. Uh, fortunately, when we talk about neural networks, we frequently don't talk about minimize the squared loss, minimize the logistic loss. Um, so what happens when you measure logistic loss? We can ask the exact same question. So now, you know, um, just talking about logistic regression, or you know, and maybe the new way to say logistic regression is we train a, a neural network with a single unit with the cross entropy loss, right? That's uh, okay, but basically just logistic regression. So we have uh, data points uh, um, x i uh, uh, y i, which I'm going to denote, uh, you know, here. So a bunch of uh, x i's with positive labels or negative labels, and we minimize logistic loss. Okay. Um, and let's assume the data is, is in high dimension. So data in high dimension is always linearly separable, but just think of the data as linearly separable. Um, and so uh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when I minim when I optimize uh, this with gradient descent, right? So where um, um, I'm going to uh, where is uh, gradient descent going to converge? Okay, so I'm, I'm minim is the question clear? I minimize uh, this objective with gradient descent. Where is gradient descent going to converge? Answers. Right. Okay, so gradient descent is actually not going to. What do you say? Yeah, it's not going to convert. If, if, uh, <laughs> gradient descent is actually not going to converge; it's going to diverge, right? Because what's going to happen here? I'm going to want to drive the logistic loss to zero. This is an important thing. The only way the logistic loss is strictly positive, right? You can never have the logistic loss be zero. You can also only drive it towards zero. And the way to drive the logistic loss towards zero is to pick some. Um, a separating hyperplane, any separating hyperplane. Okay, so at this point, and now uh, drive the the separator to infinity, w to infinity, right? And you drive w, you know, if I have a separating hyperplane, all the um, um, all these terms y times uh, w x i are positive. Okay, and now when I take uh, when I increase w, they're going to be go towards infinity, and the loss is going to go to zero, and that's the only way to drive the loss to zero. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm actually going to diverge towards infinity. And this is also something uh, important to, to keep in mind when talking about logistic loss, which is often what you're talking about, talking about like the norm of the minimizer is completely meaningless, right? Because there's no norm of the minimizer. There's no minimizer. You're going to go to infinity and the norm is always going to go to infinity. So also all kinds of other scale dependent properties like the Hesche and flatness, all kinds of stuff like that. It's it's meaningless to talk about it because you know just the more you optimize the more they're gonna the scale is gonna increase okay okay but nevertheless um, what we're gonna happen we're gonna go to infinity in a direction that corresponds to some linear separator and if I just look at the optimization problem I can drive the loss to infinity in the direction of any linear separator this linear separator or this linear uh, uh, separator um, and the question is of all these possible linear separators in which direction will I actually diverge okay or another way to to uh, to say it is if I look at the normalized predictor, which, which is the direction of the predictor, that's the only thing I care about because that's going to determine my separator, that is going to converge. Uh, in, in which direction is it going to converge? Okay. Um, and now, as uh, people mentioned here, I mean, the, the answer is again, I'm going to converge in the direction that corresponds to the max margin separator. And we'd say max margin, okay, I want to emphasize it's the max Euclidean norm margin. So it's a, the, the predictor that minimizes the Euclidean norm subject to a max margin constraint. So we still, we again see the Euclidean norm popping up here. And this Euclidean norm is specified not from the optimization problem. There's no Euclidean norm in the optimization problem. You're just logistic regression. The Euclidean norm comes up only due to the optimization, uh, only from the, the um, kind of optimization algorithm. Okay? Uh, and, um, and here again, we, we can see that if we change the optimization algorithm, we change, you know, which norm we're measuring the margin with respect to uh, in a kind of predictable way. So uh, with the uh, uh, gradient descent, uh, what does it even say? The gradient descent, we get this uh, uh, L2 uh, margin, the hard margin is VM. Uh, with steepest descent, we get, uh, uh, and we do steepest descent with respect to some norm, we get margin with respect to that norm. In particular, the important example here is coordinate descent. So now again, with coordinate descent, now it is exactly, what we get is exactly the L1 margin. So we see that, um, this inductive bias is coming from the algorithm. And an important thing to note here is that L1 versus L2 norms 
are super different, right? I mean, that can be the entire difference in learning and not learning. So especially in high dimensions, right? L1 gives you sparsity. Sparsity is like everything, right? Sparsity is feature learning, which is what you want to do. And L2 does not, right? And that comes just from changing the optimization algorithm. Um, okay, so what we see here then is back to here is that um, um, we're starting to have an understanding that maybe what's going on here, the inductive bias is actually not coming from the optimization problem, but from the optimization algorithm, okay? But that means that if I change the optimization algorithm, okay, I'm gonna change the inductive bias. And so I'm gonna change the generalization properties, okay? And we can in fact see that, okay? I'm gonna go through this uh, very quickly, but what we have here is you know, two algorithms, a blue algorithm, a red algorithm, it doesn't matter at all what they are. The thing is that both of them are, both of them are optimizing the training error, the unregularized training error, and both of them are finding a global optima, so both of them are great optimization algorithms. But what we see is they have very different generalization properties. The blue algorithm here is generalizing much better than the red algorithm. So somehow the blue algorithm is finding a better global minimum. And again, saying that is extremely unfair to the red algorithm because the red algorithm is doing exactly what we're telling it to do. It's finding a global minima. That's the only thing we told these algorithms. But somehow the, the, the implicit bias that's encoded inside these algorithms is different and the implicit bias that's encoded in the blue algorithm is better than the one encoded in the red algorithm. What I mean by better, it seems to capture this reality better, right? Maybe in a different reality, it'll be better and be different. Okay. Um, um, see here another example. Let me skip this. Okay. So, um, so the the picture we're getting here is we're saying that actually um, the 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 inductive bias is not coming from the the optimization problem formulation from the hypothesis class it's coming from uh the algorithm right and so in order to understand you know uh, neural networks we really need uh to understand what the bias of different algorithms is understanding you know uh what the what the inductive bias correspond to and then understanding that you know inductive bias or complexity measure and um how it might be good for generalization yes ben. so you have like a little bit of explicit regularization that might, maybe you're regularizing with L2, L1 norm when the implicit regularization is for the, uh, or implicit bias is the L2 norm. Do you expect it to kind of like interpolate between these two? Okay, so, so that's a good question. So what Ben is asking is what happens if I also add a bit of explicit regularization? So in these experiments, um, we, um, in our experiments, we actually didn't have uh, any explicit regularization. We did try actually also with well, we tried to really stop it, but that's not what you mean because that would be tight optimization algorithm. Um, the Zhang experiments did actually experiment also with a tiny bit of, uh, uh, of explicit bias. And actually, also some experiments, the Adam experiments, we did try some explicit bias. The question is what's going to happen then? So now um, I have uh, the other answer is more complicated. So, first of all, um, uh, for linear models, if I add explicit bias, once I add explicit regularization, then at least if this regularization is uh, strictly convex, right? if I add even a tiny, tiny bit of L2 regularization, then the global minima is unique. The problem is convex. I'm going to get there. It doesn't matter which optimization algorithm I use. Okay? So, so in that sense, the, the algorithm doesn't matter. But things become a bit trickier if I actually only optimize for finite amount of time. Okay? So take that logic, even and that is particularly important. I mean, okay, I guess we're not going to talk about we're not going to have time to talk about it, so I'll mention now. For logistic regression, for example, it takes a very, very, very long time. I mean, you never really get to the optimum, right? So asymptotically, it's not going to change where you're going to get to. But with finite amount of time, you might still see a change. And, and then you can maybe see some combination of work. But for not for non-convex models, the situation is much more complicated because for non-convex model, if you add a tiny bit of regularization. Here might be locally strictly convex, but there's still the question of which, you know, which vast uh, 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 are you going to get to, which local minima are you going to get to, and we don't completely understand this, but it seems that for a non-convex model, um, if you had a bit of a tiny bit of regularization, the implicit bias of which region are you at all going to get to is still very significant and maybe even more dominant than this tiny about amount of explicit bias, but that's not something we understand. Okay, uh, let's go back uh, to here. Um, so, okay, so um, so what we're saying is that the bias comes from the optimization algorithm and not from uh, the, not just from the hypothesis class. In fact, what I'd argue is that maybe when we're training a deep network, we're really training these huge networks, this highly overparameterized, underdetermined networks. And maybe they're really big enough. We, we, we talked before about this universal approximation results, and I kind of dissed the universal approximation results saying they're irrelevant because they don't, you know, 
they don't combine with the capacity control. But actually, we're not getting capacity control from the hypothesis class anyway, but maybe from this other uh, complexity measure. And maybe these re results are relevant. That in practice, we are actually optimizing, uh, we are actually learning using networks that are large enough to conceptually capture all functions. And I would argue that's really how we should think of, uh, of deep learning. We should deep think of deep learning as learning using an infinite size network, like similar to you think about SVMs, SVMs correspond to infinite dimensional spaces. So we shouldn't be afraid of infinities. We're really learning using an infinite, infinite size network so we can really capture all functions, okay? Um, and you know, I can say that because indeed, you know, from the, our perspective, once we're well beyond the shattering, uh, being able to shatter, then from the perspective of, of our data, you know, our hypothesis class really isn't limiting functions, uh, limiting the functions at all, right? And what I would argue is that, yeah, we're, we're really conceptually think about it as, in, as infinite networks and all functions. And in practice, maybe use some like finite uh, uh, um, architecture. The only reason you're using a finite architecture is because you're a computer scientist and you can only do finite things. You know, in the same way that when you use, um, um, when you, you, you do some kind of uh, numerical uh, uh, procedure, you think, you, know, you, you think about it in terms of reals, but none of you have ever actually implemented a real number on a computer. It's impossible to actually work with real numbers in a computer. Right? What we can work with is floating point numbers. What's a floating point number? It's some kind of finite precision truncated approximation for a real number. So we think we're working with reals, but actually we're working with these truncated representations. And that, that's maybe what we're going here. We should think that we're working with infinite dimensional networks. And in practice, maybe we're working with some finite truncation of them just so we can represent them in the computer. But in the same way that if you have, uh, if you're uh, uh, implementing some uh, 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 numerical uh, uh, procedure, right? You're finding, I don't know, the QR decomposition of a matrix. Then first of all, you think about it. How does this work over the reals? You think of real linear algebra over the reals and you think of your, your algorithm over the reals, okay? And then you also have to worry that it's actually gonna be numerically stable. And even with this finite, this finite truncation, it's still gonna be fine, okay? And maybe not, like, you know, if you do Gaussian elimination, then maybe it's fine over the reals, but not fine with the, trun with the, with the truncation, right? So it's definitely something you have to worry about. But if your numerical precision only works because of this finite truncation, right? So, I, you know, if, if you have a numerical procedure that would be incorrect over the reals, but somehow happen to be fine because you're using floats, then you're doing something wrong, right? That doesn't seem right, right? And you first have to understand how for reals, and this is, I, I'd argue, how we should understand this also. First understand your infinite dimensional networks and then worry about, you know, how, um, you know, how well they're represented with the truncation. So it's again, similar to what Matush did uh, yesterday, we are talking about infinite networks, but then also worried about, okay, just how big is infinite? Yeah. yeah. Very sensitive. And unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we have lots of work on that. I'll mention it later on in like three cent you know, half a sentence. Okay. Okay. So basically what I'm claiming here is we're really optimizing over the space of full networks. And the thing is that the only thing that's important is what is the inductive bias from the algorithm? Like what directions the algorithm uh, um, uh, like to go? Let me actually skip this. Um, okay. So, so let, so you might be thinking I'm like a bit crazy thing that really we're optimizing, you know, my view is we're optimizing over all functions. And the only thing that's important is, you know, we're optimizing using a particular procedure, which is gradient descent over, over uh, you know, the, the, the parameterization we have. And the only thing that's important is like, how do we optimize over the space? You know, what is the optimization algorithm over the space of all functions? And you might be thinking I'm a bit uh, crazy saying that, that I'm a bit exaggerating. Really, can we really think about all functions? How can we get something useful by optimizing over all functions? So <coughs> let me show you another, um, experiment we did that uh, added to my list of uh, favorite experiments. This is with the uh, uh, Surya Sakar mostly and, and other uh, co-authors. Um, and this is for metrics factorization, for, uh, sorry, metrics completion problem. So for metrics completion problem, you have a partially observed metrics. You can think of it as, I know, movie ratings for, you know, movies on the x-axis and users in the y-axis or something like that. Um, and you want to complete the unobserved entries, you know, predict uh, which, uh, you know, how people are going to like other movies, okay? And how are we going to solve this? We're going to formulate it as an optimization problem, right? In this optimization problem, we're going to take the uh, metrics, uh, the, the, uh, we're going to optimize over all possible matrices, okay, X, um, and we're going to just minimize the error to our observations, okay, our, our training error, okay? Does this make sense? No, why does it not make sense? So does this optimization problem make sense? This is like a good, is this a good procedure for doing matrix completion? 
So why not? It's completely stupid, right? I mean, so then why doesn't it make sense? Just call me that. You're filling whatever entries you want for you. Yeah, I mean, this is a completely stupid thing. I mean, it's super easy. To, okay, the, the good news is it's super easy to optimize, right? But just getting zero training error, it's like training a huge network, right? Getting to zero training error doesn't do us any good. I can just copy the observed entries and put in, like, you know, ignore all the other, put zero and all the other, put seven and all the other, put like, you know, 45 and all the others, put some sequence on the digits of pi and all the others, whatever I want, right? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's the stupidest thing ever, okay? Uh, but nevertheless, this is exactly what we're going to do, except the way we're going to represent x is as a product of two matrices, u times v. So what do we do here? And know that u times v are not like, the dimension is not constrained here. So u times v, the same dimensionality is x, okay? So I didn't change the optimization problem at all. This is exactly the same optimization problem. I'm still optimizing over all matrices. Like all functions here is all matrices, right? Um, the only thing is I, I changed it from a very simple convex optimization problem that I could easily solve, but it has too many parameters to an equivalent problem, right? These two problems are completely equivalent to an equivalent problem that has even more parameters. And now it's hard to solve, it's non-convex, right? But this is exactly what we're doing in deep learning, right? We're making things more non-convex and more complicated adding way too many parameters, right? It's the exact same optimization problem. So it doesn't make sense in the exact same way. It's very actually, you know, if I don't insist on using gradient descent, it's very easy to solve this optimization problem. How can I solve this optimization problem very easily? Okay, fine, okay, I wanna, you find a global minima, give me, in three seconds, a global minimum of this optimization problem. Right? So set, yeah, I think set copy y into u, complete it to zero, and set v to the identity. Right? It's super easy to solve. And it's completely meaningless. It's useless, right? But we're not going to solve it this way. We're going to solve it the way we do deep learning. We're going to solve it gradient descent. And now we're going to ask if we do gradient descent on u and v, okay, what are we going to get? Okay? And this is what we get. So um, what we see here um, is, first of all, the training error. The training error, this is gradient set in X, and this is gradient set in U and V. The training error is zero in both cases. So we actually succeed in finding a zero training error solution, succeed in solving the optimization problem. OK, for X, it's not so surprising because it's convex. For U and V, it's actually a bit surprising. It's not a convex optimization problem. Not obvious you'd get to the global minimum, but maybe not too surprising. So uh, um, we do, do that. But more, more interesting is to look at the test error. Okay? So if we do gradient set over X, the test error is as good as, as nothing. The only reason it's 70% here and not 100% is because I observed 30% of the entries, right? Because I'm, all I'm doing is memorizing, basically. I'm not doing anything here. But amazingly, when I do gradient descent in UNV, I actually get pretty small test error, definitely much, much better than chance, like of something like 10% test error, right? So I actually am, in, am, am introducing here the optimization, did introduce some useful inductive bias that actually enabled me to learn in this case. And I should tell you that in this case, of course, there was some hidden structure here. There was a, a, a real bias because otherwise you know, I can't do anything. Um, but the algorithm didn't know of it, right? The, the real thing here is that the reality is like approximately low rank here, okay? Um, yeah. Like you can change it. So it's not exactly objective function, it's the parameterization. Yeah, but it's not just the algorithm. Right. Okay, so I can, then let me, let, me, let me get back then okay. in uh, two minutes. Okay, if I don't answer in two minutes, then you might. Okay, okay. So okay. The solution that you get, you know, if you're there lower rank, what would you do? Uh, I'll answer that also in a second. So we looked at that, but like before, uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, change the optimization. I mean, the same as before, we changed from like this red algorithm to the blue algorithm, we slightly changed you know, instead of gradient descent. So this is gradient descent with exact line search. Instead, I can do gradient descent with very small step size. Okay. This is a worse optimization algorithm in the sense that it's going to take much longer to convert, right? Because I'm taking really small steps. It's going to eventually get to the global minimum as well, but take much longer. So optimization algorithm is bad, but somehow, in terms of its inductive bias, it's actually better. Okay, so we actually improved the inductive bias. Now our error is instead of ten percent, about five percent error. Okay, and so this is like think of what we did before. Is again we changed the optimization algorithm. And we 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 actually improved the inductive bias. But I do want to to keep in mind the scale here. So the huge improvement here was when we, not when we changed, you know, gradient descent versus, you know, uh, you know not when we changed the parameter, you know, the, with momentum, without momentum, step size, no step size. This did make a change, but this was a small change. The big, the surprising change is a change between nothing and something, okay, or nothing and a lot. And that change came from, as, as uh, Prague pointed out, by not saying, oh, instead of gradient descent, I'm going to use coordinate descent but by actually changing what I would call the parameterization, right? By, by optimizing over different optimization variables. And we'll talk about that um, in a second. So now to answer uh, your question, I think you asked it. Okay, am I getting low rank here? Well, okay. 
So what I'm getting in this case is I'm getting the minimum nuclear norm solution, which is actually a bit different than the minimum rank solution here. Um, and when we initially posed this, we said, oh, do you always or always in some sense, do you kind of generally get, you know, in, in, the, in some limiting way, get the nuclear, minimum nuclear norm solution? And we showed that in some sense, uh, yes. And if that was true, that would really kind of complete the picture here. So what, what would happen we'd identify, that means that for this deep learning procedure, we, I, we identify the actual complexity measure that we really, uh, that's really the true inductive bias. We show how the optimization algorithm minimizes it. And then we can combine it with the results we already understand uh, about the statistical properties of the minimum nuclear norm solution, right? We know that actually we can bound the complete, the, we know that the nuclear norm actually does provide this a uh, good approximation for reality. For reality is approximately low rank and it has a, a, a small capacity sublevel sets and we can kind of complete the entire story, right? But note that what we did is we're gonna, trying to separate between understanding the implicit bias and what is it implicitly minimizing and then understanding that as a complexity measure, okay? Um, it turned out that uh, uh, some follow-up work by Tengu uh, uh students showed that this is the case in some specific uh, special cases, but more recent work showed that that's not generally the case. We still don't know exactly what's happening here. It's, it's, some, it's still very related to the nuclear norm, uh, but it's not exactly, it's definitely not the minimum rank. Um, okay, um, so this is, yeah. So for the um, previous case, it showed that you found the minimum pretty solution. So does that just depend on the parameterization? Yeah, no, so that's an excellent question. So the minimum norm, SDG finds a minimum norm solution for uh, uh, just for, that's only true for, the, for uh, linear regression. Okay, so that's a very special case. And uh, what's happening here, well, let me get back to that in a second, because okay, that's related to Friday's question. I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm very happy to ask him all these questions because I actually know the questions I know how to answer. So, <laughs> um, okay, but let's first see another example. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, in, in the experiment uh, where you got uh, minimum nuclear norm uh, of X as a solution, uh, were the resulting U and V uh, dependent on, like, how are they dependent on the minimum nuclear norm X? Uh, were there some factors of... Uh, they're not, okay. I'm not sure what, what you're getting, but I can tell you that they are not the, like, minimum uh, norm factorization for that, uh, for that minimum nuclear norm solution. Okay. Um, okay, so um, let's get, so we already, I claim that, that this is already a neural net. I mean, this is like a you know, two layer neural net with the, uh, with the linear tensor, but let's look at things that actually look more like neural net at least in terms of diagrams. Uh, so we already talked about a neural net, right? So if we, we train a single uh, unit neural net, also known as logistic regression, we know we get the hard margin SVM solution. What happens if we train, still talking about linear activation, so um, uh, train a, a um, a larger network, but a larger linear network. So what's this, uh, what's going on here? What's a linear network? All the activations are linear, which means the output is a linear function of inputs. So again, I'm just training a linear model here, really, right? So my all functions, all functions here is all linear functions, right? Because I'm still just in space. I can't go beyond these linear functions. And this doesn't make any sense. Why would I represent a linear function in this stupid way using a linear uh, neural net? But we already, we already saw from matrix factorization is actually changing the parameterization changing our representative function can actually introduce uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, interesting inductive bias. So we can ask what happens if we train a, a fully connected linear network with gradient descent. Okay, I'm gonna to convert to some linear predictor, some linear predictor that's gonna separate the data, but which linear predictor it separates the data. Okay, and that series is actually pretty boring. We're still gonna to convert to the max uh, Euclidean norm, so, uh, the max margin solution on the Euclidean norm, so minimum Euclidean norm solution with margin of one. Same hard margin SPM. We actually didn't gain anything by heading more units. Um, but if we switch to convolutional networks, things become more interesting. So now we're still talking about linear networks. So we're still, the space of all functions is all linear functions, but now we present them using these linear convolutional networks. Okay, so all the uh, units have the same weights, but kind of rotate, right? So it's a rank one, uh, um, rank one full width uh, uh, um, cyclic convolution, okay? Uh, and now what happens if I train this with gradient descent? So again, the optimization problem is still, I'm just doing, basically I'm just doing logistic regression with a strange representation. I'm still just minimizing, you know, switching over linear uh, uh, predictors. But uh, what happens if I train this with the uh, gradient set? Any guesses? Some of you probably have seen this before. What? I've read the yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of you have seen this before. So you can tell in this case, what you're gonna get, you're also gonna get to max margin, but instead of respect to your cleaning norm, you're gonna get to max margin with respect to, so at least if you have one convolution, so one hidden layer, 
you're going to, have to get to max margin respect to the L1 norm of the in the frequency domain of the predictor. So you're going to get kind of sparsity. You're going to find predictors that are sparse in the frequency domain. Okay, so this is actually very rich inductive bias. And again, it, it only comes from the optimization because the, the problem formulation here is basically you're just doing linear again, logistic regression. You're just finding a linear predictor. But the optimization, the way we're doing the, the optimization determines which linear predictor, determines the actual complexity measure. Okay? Um, this is with one hidden layer. With more hidden layers, you get something that corresponds to even you know, to this uh, two over depth quasi norm. So if you have two, 10 layers, you get the 0.2 quasi norm. It's like more and more sparsely inducing. So you get things that look like this. This is uh, with a fully connected network. You just get a minimum Euclidean norm predictor. It doesn't have very clear uh, uh, frequencies. With the one hidden layer convolution, you already see a very uh, uh, definite frequency. And with the depth five, you know, it's a, a super sparse uh, in the frequency domain. So a very clear uh, frequency. So we already saw uh, two examples of how I'm optimizing over the space of all functions. And just the way I'm doing the optimization determines what I'm going to get in a very rich and meaningful way. In one case, all functions was all, all matrices, which you can think of as all functions from index pairs to values. That's you know, all functions. And here, all functions is all linear functions. But what about really all functions, like you know, from R to R or something like that? Okay, so let's look at all functions from R to R. Uh, so that I can capture using a, even a single hidden layer uh, ReLU network can capture all functions. So let's think about training a single hidden layer ReLU network. And I promised you we're going to not limit the size. So infinite width, single hidden layer ReLU network. So now I can really capture all functions. Okay? And I'm going to train that with gradient descent. So I'm going to get to zero error. And right? I'm going to actually uh, fit, my, um, uh, uh, fit my data. But the question is, there are many ways of fitting the data, right? Which, uh, uh, which function that fits the data I'm going to, going to prefer? What's my, uh, what's my inductive bias here? And the answer is easy to state at least with, for univariate functions, right? If the input is just a single unit, there's functions from R to R, but this is already interesting, right? You, know, you, you spend a lot of time in high school just fitting functions from R to R, okay? uh, maybe also after high school. Okay? Okay? And the answer here is if on all functions, you're going to pick the function that minimizes the integral of the absolute value of its second derivative. Okay? So what does that uh, correspond to, right? That's kind of some kind of smoothness measure, right? You're going to prefer functions that are smooth in this way or simple in this way, going back to this word simple, okay? So this is exact same way. So this is, makes sense, right? This is a very reasonable smoothness measure or simplicity measure, okay? But it definitely did not come out from our formulation, right? Our formulation was just minimize the training error over the space of all function that I parameterized in a particular way, okay? But we see that this pops out from the way we're doing this optimization. Okay. Um, this is for univariate functions. We can extend it for uh, multivariate functions. Again, we can characterize it, although it's a bit uh, uh, trickier to write down. It comes out to higher order derivatives for the Redon transform. Um, so in all of these cases, we see that we are actually optimizing over all functions and all the inductive bias is determined by the optimization. So now to answer uh, Priya's question and I think uh, Tyler's question also there, um, does it all amount, you know, what we did here when you say the change optimization algorithm, at first, they told you about optimization algorithm, gradient descent, coordinate descent can be a big difference. But here, we're just talking about gradient descent. What we're changing is really the parameterization. But, but changing the parameterization, does, if I think of it in perspective of the space of functions, it changes how I do the local search over functions. So the way you should think about it is, what's the, the geometry under which I do the local search? How am I navigating the space of all functions? And changing the parameterization definitely changes that. So, um, you can really you can just think of it as the parameter space and the function space. What I care about is what happens in the parameter space. And what happens is maybe that in, func in, uh, in function space, in parameter space, maybe I, I, you know, I both have to think about what's the geometry look like in parameter space. And that's maybe relatively simple, right? It looks like, you know, some balls. And it still depends on optimization algorithm. But this is maybe a relatively small difference, okay? Um, and the bigger difference is how when I change the parameters, the parameterization, how it induces a very different uh, 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 geometry in function space. So it's a combination of both of these. And I, I would call both of these the optimization algorithm because part of the choice when I'm optimizing is what am I doing gradient descent with respect to, right? That's from my perspective, part of my, uh, uh, my optimization algorithm. So, but this means that if I tell you, you know, I, I, I kind of told you in the beginning that the hypothesis class doesn't matter. You can think of it as, oh, the architecture doesn't matter. It's just a representation for all functions. The architecture does matter. But the way the architecture matters is in a, in a it's not that the architecture determines your hypothesis class. It's not that the architecture determines your capacity. Okay? 
what the architecture deter determines, the way the architecture is important because the architecture determines the geometry of the search in the space of all functions. Okay? And this is kind of how maybe we should think about you know, the effect of the architecture, which is a very different way of thinking about the architectures determining a model class. Okay? Um, and so things, you know, at the end of the day, the inductive bias is determined by a combination of, of multiple things. Probably the most important thing is this architecture, the choice of parameterization. The second, but still important thing, is kind of how you do the local search inside here. Do you do coordinate descent, gradient descent? What's the geometry inside here? And then also important, but like much, much less. So that's going to be the difference between that, you know, 10% error and 5% error um, is the specific of optimization, like initialization, batch size, you know, step size, stuff like that. Okay. Um, and again, now when I'm saying the difference in 10% and 5%, is that significant or not? I don't know. Like, you know, people make a huge difference about the difference between 3.64% error and 3.61% error. But in terms of understanding what's going on, what I care about is the difference in 90% error and 3.64 error, whatever I said before, right? Um, we're still also looking at this because in, in extreme cases, that can also make a huge difference. Um, uh, yes. Okay, so just to summarize uh, uh, discussion of inductive bias before uh, we move on. Um, so much of our work uh, uh, then, and uh, also I should say work of uh, many others, um, we focus on this, like trying to understand things using the complexity measure, you know, what I would consider the complexity measure approach. And this really means trying to kind of disentangle and study two different questions. One is um, take an optimization algorithm and ask, you know, optimization of the gradient descent usually over parameterization and ask, what is the complexity measure that it induces? Okay. Um, um, so we identify uh, uh, this complexity measure, like for example, for gradient descent uh, over. Uh, uh, um, uh, okay, we had all these examples before, like for example, this you know, um, uh, uh, bridge penalty or in the frequency domain. And then we can, uh, 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 we can ask the, the uh, generalization and, and uh, approximation properties of this complexity measure, right? Ask, ask this question of, you know, um, what's the understand the, the capacity of the sublevel sets of this complexity measure and how well they capture reality, okay? And so much of our work has been uh, kind of uh, in here and um, thinking of, you know, how both, uh, um, um, how does optimization affect this inductive bias? Mostly, as I said, in terms of different parameterizations, different architectures, but also different choices. And this is like, for example, the initialization scale that was mentioned is very crucial uh, and can make a big difference. And like, not just between like, you know, 10% and 5%, we can show that like can make a difference between uh, it all being doing something useful and not doing some, anything useful at all. I'm not gonna talk about this today, but I can refer you to our, uh, uh, our, uh, our paper in that. Um, and other things, took us, another question that to me right now, the most interesting question is stuff where uh, something we're still trying to understand is what the effect of, of stochasticity. If I use batch gradient descent or gradient descent with a very large step size, and probably is going to use stochastic gradient descent, maybe with a very small, let's say step size, batch size. I'm going to use a large batch size. And probably is going to use stochastic gradient descent, maybe with a very, very small batch size. Okay. We're going to both maybe eventually optimize, get zero error, but is there going to be a very big difference, a fundamental difference between the inductive bias I'm going to induce, the, complex, the implicit complexity measure I'm going to have, and the one that Prague is going to have? And that's still something I think as a community we're, we're uh, still trying to understand. Um, I, um, I, I should just. Uh, um, I, I should just say as a disclaimer that I do think that there's a lot of uh, to be gained from this complexity measure approach, but we have to also be cognizant that it has some limitations. And there are definitely there are phenomena that we know cannot be exactly explained by uh, by you know by separating to these problems, identify a, a complexity measure that's simplistically minimized by the algorithm and then studying it. Uh, but um, you know there's still a lot to be gained by it. And also it's important to understand what can't be gained by it. And you know, we can talk, have, I don't think anybody this week is gonna talk about this, but there's a, a lot of uh, current research about this. But I actually wanna move away from inductive bias. So before you ask any more questions, I'm gonna to switch to the next slide. Uh, did you have a question to ask or? Yeah. Uh, so in this picture, this picture? The, the story here is like at particular parameterization, there's some implicit bias or some inductive bias. And as you change, like in the picture you show like, change the size of the network, some of the implicit bias comes And it looks like as you increase the size, the implicit bias which is induced is better because the generalization is better. Okay. Uh, uh, and in what I said, okay, actually, I think I'm gonna to get to that. Yeah, so you're asking why is that? Yeah. Okay, excellent question. So look at this. 
<laughs> it's a question. That's a question. Okay. So what we explained so far, right, is why is it that over here we don't generalize? Depending on where you said, we're not generalizing. You know, the the network size is not providing capacity control, and we're saying that's because the x-axis is is not the real inductive bias. The real inductive bias is uh, some measure of uh, norm or scale. We maybe don't know what it is, but that's really what's giving us generalization. But why is this decreasing here? I didn't tell you why is it decreasing. Okay, is that new? And now again, again, that's maybe not too surprising because um, under my view, the real object is an infinite dimensional network. So really the real thing is way over, or I can with this pointer point like off the board, but like, you know, infinite size. And so what happens is that's really what, that's the gold standard, what we want to. And we're getting, as we have higher, you know, more and more units, we're better approximating it. In the same sense that you're going to get better results if you use, if you're doing some numerical calculation, then if you increase from, you know, 16 bit to 32 bit to 64 bit floats, you're, uh, you're going to improve your accuracy. Okay, your, your, your things are going to be better because you're approximating things better. Okay, And again, that's actually not something uh, that's new. We see uh, this behavior and maybe the best uh, place to see it, or the easiest place to see it, is if you're, um, you're doing uh, Gaussian kernel SVM. I keep going back to Gaussian kernel SVMs because I really think that captures like all the phenomena basically we're, we're seeing here. So you're doing Gaussian kernel SVM. So Gaussian kernel uh, SVMs correspond to using a kernel. What's a kernel? A kernel is just an, a representation of an infinite dimensional feature space, right? So we are working in infinite dimensional space. And you, we, okay, fine. We have this representation theorem that allows us to directly work with infinite dimensional space. But suppose I don't know the representer theorem. I can still actually, uh, an alternative approach that actually in practice is, is frequently uh, uh, very fruitful, is to look at a uh, um, finite dimensional approximation to our infinite dimensional space. And that's exactly what we do when we use a random features approach, right? So what's random feature approach to Gaussian kernels? We just approximate our Gaussian kernel using a finite number of random features. As the number of features goes to infinity, we approximate, the, we get a perfect approximation for a Gaussian kernel, okay? And so now you can think of this, X axis here is number of units is like number of random features that we're going to use. So what happens now when we increase the number of features? When we increase the, the when we increase the dimensionality, okay, this is now the dimensionality. When we increase the dimensionality, we get better, and it doesn't actually the generalization is not coming from the low dimensionality. The capacity control is not coming from the dimensionality at all. That's coming from the norm, right? But as we increase the dimensionality, we get better and better approximation for the Gaussian kernel, and so. We're better in cap. We're we're better approximating. You know, we always get some number. The norm that we're actually minimizing is a better approximation of the real norm we care about. And so things will, you know, our, our inductive bias, can, you know, becomes better and better inductive bias, and we converge to the real thing. Okay. So this is um, in another way to see it. Another example, in which maybe is makes for a simpler story to understand, although it's a bit different. And um, goes back to metrics completion and metrics factorization. And as you see, there's very few problems I actually understand. SVMs and metrics completion are pretty much, you know, almost the only two things I understand. And luckily, you can get a, a lot just by them. So for metrics completion, no metrics completion, you can use metrics factorization uh, approach. And then uh, you can say that, well, maybe what I want to do is instead of having a capacity control, which is the rank, which kind of corresponds, if you think of movies, the rank corresponds to how many factors determine whether people like movies or not. So limiting to rank seven corresponds to, oh, you think that there are only seven factors determine how many people like movies or not. It turns out that a much better inductive bias in practice, I mean, this is you know, a question about reality, as I said, is not to limit the number of factors, but to limit their magnitude. And that corresponds to limiting the nuclear norm or max norm, maybe some, some norm measure. Uh, of the metrics. And that means, oh, there's not seven uh, factors determined. There might be an infinite factor, number of factors that determine how much people like movies, but their overall importance is bounded. Okay. But now what we can do is, again, we can, um, that corresponds to, to explicitly regularizing uh, the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the norms of U and V of the factors, or you can just think of it as the uh, the nuclear norm of X. But now the problem is if I'm looking at something like you know, uh, uh, the Netflix or movie lens uh, matrices, their matrices are sized like, like a million by 100,000. I can't actually represent a matrix of size a million by 100,000. So I'm actually gonna, for computational reasons, represent it as a low rank matrix, as U times V. So again, my, my representation of X as U times V as a low rank matrix is not because of statistical reasons, it's purely because of computational reasons. Now you can ask, what happens if I increase the dimensionality of this representation? Okay, increase the rank of X. We're still, I'm, I'm actually learning by explicitly minimizing the, the nuclear norm. And the answer, and you see this very clearly empirically, is that the, the higher and higher the dimensionality, the better results you get, right? Because the higher, think of it as you really want to minimize the nuclear norm. If I use a rank, 
uh, 50 metrics. And uh, Ben has access to much, much better computers than me and with much more memory and uses a, a rank 70 metrics, or actually let's go to realistic figures when we did this here, where I use a rank 300 and he uses a rank 500, okay? Then we're, we're both gonna minimize the nuclear norm. Who's gonna have a smaller nuclear norm? Me that, with a rank 300 or Ben with a rank 500? Okay, so Ben is necessarily gonna have a smaller nuclear norm because whatever nuclear norm I can get, Ben can also get it. But he can maybe use his additional 200 dimensions to drive the nuclear norm even smaller, okay? And so he's actually gonna generalize better and definitely see this empirically. And again, this is another example of how things improve when the dimensionality increases because again, the dimensionality, the important thing is dimensionality does not control, is not a statistical thing. It doesn't actually give you statistical benefit. It's only computational compromise, computational memory and so forth, yeah. Yeah, so it's an excellent question. I'm not going to be talking about uh, today, although I can spend another hour talking about the NTK. And the, um, so um, the NTK is exactly, you know, because you know, one infinite dimensional model. And the, um, as you said, I don't, it doesn't, I don't think it actually captures what's going on in neural networks. And the thing is that um, the NTK is a, you, when the network go, the net width goes to infinity, it, with a particular scaling of other things, you approach the NTK. And I would argue that that's just not the correct kind of uh, uh, scaling limit to take. If you take the scaling in a different way, and this goes back to, I think you asked about the initialization scale. So if you look at the paper with the uh, Blake Woodworth, so, um, the Woodworth et al. There's a paper, and we ex exactly show that as you take, as you increase the width, if you scale the initialization scale appropriately, you, you know, if you scale it inappropriately, you get to the NTK limit. If you scale it appropriately, you get to a different limit that is meaningful and is good. So, okay, so, so you're right that if you do things uh, incorrectly, and I think Pitum uh, talked, well, wait, we saw it yesterday, right? I think, oh, I think you, pre uh, Spencer presented some of Pitum's results. Is Pitum still here? I know. Uh, maybe we'll see these results. I don't think we'll see them later on this week. That in fact, if you don't think, do things correctly, then things actually become worse when you increase dimensionality. But again, it's because you're not, I would argue it's because you're not doing things correctly. Okay, um, okay. so let's go back to here. And so the, the um, so, so far, I only talked to you about how we actually know everything. Okay? And that's, I think for the most part uh, true, like all, all trying to convince you that all the statistical theory uh, that we developed, all the, the understanding of machine learning different, over the decades, definitely is applicable also to deep learning. We just, you know, we definitely to see, you know, what is the complexity measure? What's the implicit bias? You know, how is capacity control? We have to answer all these questions, but the frame, the general framework is still valid and can use to explain all these phenomena. But there's one thing that really doesn't exactly fit, okay? Um, and it's maybe not related to deep learning, uh, but it is something we noticed as a community only in the past few years. And that's the, the, the following, that what we're doing here and telling you that what's actually happening is I'm actually minimizing some other complexity measure, but I'm not doing SRM. What I'm doing is actually what I'd call MDL, right? So we said that what we, where's my pointer? Okay, we said that we wanna be, uh, we wanna pick a predictor somewhere on this path to balance between complexity and error. But what, what we're, all these uh, implicit bias things, what they're doing is they're actually pitting a predictor that's the minimum norm predictor with zero error. So that's this extreme point that corresponds to lambda goes to zero of this balance, okay? So we're picking this predictor always and not something here. Okay, so we're not picking some generic ERM, it's a very special ERM, but it's an extreme point of this balance. And that's not what we're supposed to do, right? What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to balance fit and, uh, uh, you know, what we were told to do is to balance fit and, and, uh, and complexity. Okay, and not just the extreme point. And yet we are succeeding in learning, even in noisy situations, even in situations where there is a positive approximation. So really we should be balancing. We're succeeding in learning even when we're in this extreme point, right? So when you go back to these results, in particular, we see that even if we get, you know, I'm, I'm saying that this is a noisy situation because the test accuracy is far from zero. We still get about 15% error. And yet somehow it's fine to get, you know, we're, we're succeeding learning even when we're trying to training error to zero, even though our classical theory is going to tell us not to do that. Let's remind us the classic theory, and then this, um, goes back. Um, so I think slides from my my uh, second lecture in my machine learning course. You know, you want to uh, fit some data. You know, again, that's the univariate data. And you want to fit it with a simple number. 
So what happens when you change the degree of the polynomial, right? So degree zero polynomial has a very bad fit. That's very bad, okay? If we increase the degree, we can get better and better fit, right? And so forth. But what's going to happen at some point, so the red points here are the training points and the green points are the test points. At some point, we're going to fit the, the red points very well, but we're going to start overfitting the red points, right? And we're going to fit the, blue, the green points even worse, right? When you get to the green nine here, I can perfectly fit the, the red points. That's an extreme point in the curve, right? When I get zero error, maybe using the minimal degree to get zero error, but this is still going to completely overfit and get very bad uh, test error. That's not what we're supposed to do, okay? Um, and so, um, right, so we get these curves. These are the classic curves. This is exactly from this data. Um, we get the test area is the, the red line. Initially, it's decreasing because we're getting better fit. But at some point in the data here was actually generated by two, by two dimensions, the right uh, uh, degree there is two. Here, the estimation error is starting increasing and we're, we're overfitting, right? And we get, uh, we know that overfitting is bad, right? So um, we have lots of uh, uh, books and all the books, all the courses tell us that overfitting is bad, that we should never, you know, predictor that really gets zero training or is often generalized poorly. So again, just to clarify, I think yesterday I also asked what I mean by overfitting. So our perspective over here, we're underfitting. Underfitting means that we're not even capturing the signal. Overfitting means that not only are we capturing the signal, we're starting to capture the noise. We're fitting the noise. That's from my perspective, it's a vision of overfitting. We're fitting the noise. We're fitting something that are, we can't actually fit, okay? Because it's random or it's beyond the reach of our, uh, of our model class, okay? And this shouldn't work. And yet we're seeing that, that um, you know, it should be somewhere here. Where, where you know this point is over here, but somehow it seems that it is working. And this uh, um, uh, um, uh, this was uh, the first paper that came out of it was in the context of the double descent. I want to maybe this is maybe the last thing I'm going to have time to do today, but I think this is important to disentangle a bit uh, this issue of double descent versus uh, um, be, be overfitting not being bad, but this benign overfitting. So I'd argue the double descent we actually understand very well. There's no issue understanding double descent. The issue is about everything. What I mean by understanding double descent. So we have these plots. Um, let's say, okay, we expect something to go like this. This is what I showed you in this uh, previous uh, graph. But what we're actually seeing when you increase the capacity of H is first of all, the test error goes up, right? It's fine. But then there's another descent that goes down. And what's going on here? This is, was pointed out by... Uh, um, uh, Misha Melkin, Daniel Shu, uh, Sriyan Ma, and uh, Sumik Mandel in a, a very influential uh, and important paper. But let's try to understand what's going on with this double descent. So what, when, they, when we say capacity, right, they're, when they're thinking of this as a cartoon, but they backed it up with those results, their measure of capacity is, again, dimension. And specifically, they're talking about something maybe even as simple as this uh, uh, linear regression model, okay? Uh, so we have this linear regression model that the, they're minimizing the test error, the training error, which is just the, the squared loss of linear predictor. And what we're plotting here uh, is, uh, uh, is the test error of, uh, of this predictor. Okay? But the thing is that what is this predictor? So they say this predictor is just uh, the minimizer of the test loss. Okay? But what do we mean minimizer of the test loss? Uh, sorry, minimizer of the training loss. What's the minimizer of the training loss? It's not really the minimizer of the training loss because they obtain it in a particular way. And we already saw that just saying we're minimizing the training error, especially in this regime here, which is underdetermined, it matters how you minimize the training error, right? So in particular, um, um, if they minimized it with gradient descent over, uh, uh, with gradient descent, we know they'll get the minimum predictor. They didn't actually use gradient descent. How, I mean, if you actually needed to use the least square problem, right now I give you some data and I told you to solve the least square problem, how are you gonna solve it? Inverting a matrix. Oh my God, you should never invert a matrix. That's horrible. It's computationally efficient, numerically unstable. And anyway, how are you going to invert a matrix? You're going to program some Gaussian elimination. What are you actually going to do on your, anybody has a laptop? You have a laptop here open, right? I give you now, right now, I'm going to give you a USB key with some data. And then you want to solve a least square problem. What are you going to do on your laptop? So you're going to be with? With some, do some uh, um, data on it. You want to solve a least square problem. How are you going to solve the least square problem? On your laptop, what are you going to do? You have a laptop also. What are you going to do? Maybe if you have a laptop session. What are you going to do? How are you going to solve this square problems? Sci-fi, right. right. You're not going to invert a metrics. You're going to use sci-fi. Okay. Who's going to use sci-fi? Okay. How many people are going to use sci-fi? How people are going to... You know what this is? How many people are going to use MATLAB? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the thing is that these things, they actually don't use gradient descent, but they also use a procedure. Um, it's a specific numerical procedure. And what does this do? So actually, if you go to the, to the documentation for this, what they tell you 
If you go to the uh, documentation of uh, NumPy least, uh, um, least square, what it does, what it says is, if the problem is overdetermined, it returns the minimum error solution. But if the problem is underdetermined, it returns the minimum norm solution, right? So it actually, the documentation itself ad admits that it has this, it's not implicit bias at this point, it's explicit bias, it says so in the documentation. But really the documentation says there are two different learning rules here, right? On the left-hand side here, the documentation says it minimizes the error. On the right-hand side, the documentation says, oh, I'm actually using a completely different learning rule. The, the learning rule used on the right-hand side is minimum norm solution, okay? And so really the reason we get your two different behaviors is because we're just using two different learning rules. I mean, we get both of them with the same, you know, uh, uh, same Python routine or same MATLAB. MATLAB acts are same thing, okay? Uh, but they're really two different learning rules, okay? So, um, um, and so now uh, this learning rule, we understand how it behaves. And now this learning rule, why does this go down? Well, this is exactly the explanation we had before, right? I and mean, this is exactly the thing. I mean, it goes down because uh, uh, in these particular examples, the, the, the complexity control is no longer coming from the dimensionality. This x-axis is not capacity. This x-axis is how well we approximate, okay? Uh, and so we understand very well that we approximate the, the, the real norm we care about better and better, then we get uh, better generalization. And there's no mystery here. Okay, um, and then what is the, um, and, um, and, and I should say, uh, okay, so what, uh, what is the mystery here? So this one we understand very well if we actually are in a situation where, in this realizable situation where the right thing to do is really to find a minimum norm solution, a minimum norm zero solution. But the strange thing here is that this is, if we're going to be here, the strange thing here, and this is really the, the thing, the, the interesting, the super interesting thing that uh, Misha Belkin pointed out is that using this uh, extreme solution, this extreme end of the regularization path is working even in noisy settings, even in settings which we, we're definitely overfitting, that we should be balancing, but we're not, right? So the real mystery is not the descent. It's the fact that, that we're doing minimum description length. We're doing zero error, minimum norm zero error solution in not finding a balance in situations which are noisy and so we should find the balance. Why, are you, why am I saying the situation is definitely noisy? So you already saw an example, uh, Spencer showed an example uh, yesterday where he just didn't, it, he, knows it, he knows it's noisy because he added the noise himself. He took a problem that's linearly separable, okay, fine for that, finding a max margin zero error solution is perfectly fine, but then he added 15% error. So, and then he, he trains the network, he trains his network, to have zero error. I'm gonna go a few minutes uh, over here, excuse me, to, to have zero error. So he's definitely overfitting. I know he's overfitting. He knows he's overfitting because there's 15% error and he get 50, the, the true labels have 15% error and he's getting zero error, which means he's necessarily fitting the noise. That's the definition of overfitting. So he's fitting the noise, okay? And, never the, and, and yet somehow, even though he's uh, overfitting, he's generalizing fine, okay? And so Spencer showed us this uh, uh, yesterday. And again, the first uh, to point this out was uh, Misha Belkin very explicitly using a, you know, a very similar experiment, taking data that is then separable, adding even very large amounts of noise, um, fitting it to zero error and seeing that you still succeed in, in learning, you know, getting much better than, uh, uh, than the null error. So what's going on here is it's not that the overfitting is helpful here. Um, over here, Spencer got the same, you know, over here, he's not yet overfitting and he already gets a uh, good error, right? So it's not that overfitting helps you get a uh, small error, but it doesn't hurt you, it's benign, okay? So roughly you should think of it this way. So the overfitting we saw before with this polynomial fit was harmful overfitting. It looked like this. Over here, in order to fit the noise, to overfit, I need to work very hard and really change the function everywhere. And so I completely ruin my generalization performance. And somehow it seems that in many settings, okay, the overfitting, whoa, go back. The overfitting is benign. So in many settings, the overfitting looks more like this. This is, this is also an overfit. This is made up. This is a cartoon, right? I drew this in PowerPoint. This doesn't correspond to result of any experiment, right? But this kind of captures what's going on. That I have a curve that fits the, the signal pretty well. And then in order to fit the noise, I only make tiny changes that fit that noise part, you know, I fit all the noise, but without ruining the fit everywhere else. So somehow the overfitting, the, I can fit the noise with a zero measure effect overall. It doesn't have any effect on random examples, okay? And a question we're trying to understand now, I'm gonna, I had some stuff to say about it, but I'm not gonna say it, but that's fine because we're gonna hear two talks this afternoon about the benign overfitting, is exactly understanding 
when does overfitting looks like this and when does overfitting look like this, right? And let me just jump over all this. Uh, okay, maybe, okay, maybe I'll just quickly without getting into details, I can say that um, Spencer, okay, because just Spencer promised you that I'll talk about it. So maybe I will talk about it. Um, there's a, a, a question of how, you know, can you hope to understand overfitting using uniform convergence? So usually when you think about uniform convergence, the way we explain things is we bound the, uh, the loss of the return predictor, of the learned predictor, by its empirical error, plus the difference between uh, the empirical and population, which is the, uh, the, the um, or uniform convergence bound. And usually what we say when you do balanced learning, we learn a predictor in a way that the, um, uh, the empirical error converges to the true, uh, uh, you know, you know the, the kind of, uh, the error of the optimal predictor, this noise level, okay? And now what we have to say is this, this you know, the, the deviation goes to zero. And that's fine because if we have bounded complexity and the number of samples increases, then this deviation goes to zero. This is our usual analysis. And now the question is, do we have any hope of using this analysis to analyze uniform to analyze uh, an interpolating predictor, a predictor that gets zero error, okay? To analyze uh, benign overfitting. So again, just to get the terminology, interpolating predictor, I mean, any predictor between the zero error predictor and overfitting is benign if that interpolating predictor actually generalizes fine, okay? uh, even though there's noise. So now the thing is that for an interpolating predictor, the training error by definition is gonna be zero. And so this deviation, cannot possibly go down to zero, right? Because I cannot get error better than the, than the noise level. So what I need to show is that this deviation goes down exactly to the noise level. And this is very strange. Like this is a deviation between two errors. This is not like the noise level. How can it go down magically exactly to the noise level? And if I wanna use bounds for that, know that if my bound is off by a constant factor, I'm dead. Because if my bound is off by a factor of 10, instead of getting here, you know, you know, this thing, I get 10 times this, right? Then I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna con uh, get something here which is 10 times the noise level. I'm not gonna get consistency. I'm not gonna show that I actually get down to the noise level. So I need super precise generalization guarantees. And nevertheless, um, um, uh, so um, what I'm not gonna tell you about today, but uh, this is a joint work with uh, Freddie Kohler and uh, Lisa Zhao and uh, Danica Sutherland and uh, recently also with uh, Priya. Uh, we can actually get uh, uh, generalization, uh, uniform convergence guarantees that are tight enough to help to explain this. Um, let me jump over all this. Um, this is, um, and just uh, get to here. And um, without explaining everything, like, again, the goal of all this, and this is what maybe you should keep in mind to the talks you're going to hear, I think, this afternoon, is again, characterize when is overfitting benign and when is overfitting harmful. And for at least for, uh, maybe I'll go back uh, to here, at least for, um, uh, for linear regression, uh, infinite, dimension, infinite dimensional linear regression, we have a sense of when is overfitting benign and when is it harmful. So in particular, we have a characterization of when is overfitting benign. When is overfitting for linear regression gonna be benign? And they have these uh, uh, sufficient conditions and this is, this is uh, essentially going back to uh, work by uh, Peter Bartlett and others with some slight simplifications. So we have two conditions, these red conditions and the green condition. So, okay, don't, don't look even at the slide because I didn't tell you, I'll just tell you what, what they are because, so on one hand, we need, the, the, we need our model, we need reality uh, to actually, uh, we, we, need, we need our feature space to be such that its norm of the features doesn't uh, uh, increase too much because then if it doesn't increase too much, then the, the um, uh, what happens is that we're going to have too high capacity to, to even be able to learn. We can't learn. So the red conditions that I'm not telling you are, our conditions have nothing to do with benign overfitting. They're necessary at all to get consistent using any predictor. The question is, when is benign overfitting going to work? In order to do that, um, what we need is to have many, many features as captured by this effective rank of our uh, 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 of our covariates. So this is roughly comparing the um, uh, uh, the uh, square of the or the the, the the sum of the the square of the sum of the eigenvalues to this to the square of the sum of to the sum of the square of the eigenvalues. So if at least all the eigenvalues are the same, this is exactly the, num the dimensionality. And what we need is this for this dimensionality to increase to be super linear in the number of samples. We need it to be very easy to fit the the noise. If it's very easy to fit the noise, then we're gonna just fit it using these spikes. This is roughly what's going on here. 
you probably didn't understand any of this. I would not understand this from this explanation. But the, the thing is that this allows us to really understand and characterize in different situations, depending on the spherical decay, when is overfitting benign, like we have here, right? So this is a situation. So the, the red line here is the, uh, the population risk when um, it's, um, uh, so, okay. So now this is important. So as I told you, the problem with this double descent curve, okay, this is actually the reason I want to show this uh, slide, this is the last slide, is because the x-axis was wrong. The x-axis did not plot capacity like you know, it was claimed, the x-axis plot, plotted you know, uh, uh, precision of approximation. Okay? So now I'm showing you with the correct x-axis. What I mean the correct x-axis, this correct axis does correspond to capacity. What I'm actually plotting here is lambda, is the regularization parameter. But note that you know, when the regularization parameter um, uh, is large as it is here, then the predictor has very small norm and norm here is the correct capacity. And then when I increase it, I get smaller and smaller, uh, larger and larger norm uh, predictor. So this x-axis here is monotone in the norm, which is the correct capacity measure here. Okay? In, in, uh, in benign overfitting, we see that even if we have very, very large norm predictors, okay, um, um, then we do not overfit, right? Because, no, sorry, we do overfit, but the overfitting is benign. We, we don't get, uh, the, the generalization doesn't hurt us, doesn't suffer. Whereas in harmal overfitting, what happens is that there is this blue line is the correct balance, right? This is the optimal balance on the, do I have this plot uh, yet? No, sorry, I didn't understand. So this blue line corresponds to the correct balance between fit and, and, uh, and norm. And in both cases, this works well. The thing is that what happens in benign overfitting, it doesn't hurt us to, oh, to under-regularize. Doesn't hurt us to use a larger and larger norm. Doesn't hurt us to overfit. We don't gain anything, but we don't lose either. We don't gain much. In, where in other cases, when the spectral decay is, is too fast, uh, the overfitting is harmful. Okay? Um, and this is kind of what we want to look at, the difference in these two behaviors. Okay? So this is, um, and, and we can understand it. And also, I think what we're going to be here this afternoon is this uh, 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 dichotomy of benign overfitting and harmful overfitting is a bit too crude. Because what actually happens frequently is that overfitting is not completely destructive. It doesn't completely ruin your error, but it's not completely benign either. It hurts you, but it only hurts you a bit. And I think we'll be hearing a talk about this this afternoon, right? Uh, where's the speakers? Uh, right? Okay. Right? That, uh, okay, good. Um, okay. Uh, oh, that's the plot I wanted. Anyway. Yeah. So this, okay, maybe I'm going to say this again because this is, I think, important, right? What we're seeing here, this, the x axis here corresponding to traversing this spread of frontier. Okay? And we know that we should be at this point. Okay? That's the optimum point. That's what their classical theory tells us. This is this blue line. Okay? And this point is fine either way. The real question is what happens if I go past this point? In the harmful for overfitting, I really have to be exactly in that point. I start, if I go past this point, this is underfitting here, and this is overfitting. Underfitting is always bad, shrinkage. And here, overfitting, in a harmful for overfitting situation, overfitting is also bad. Okay, but in a benign overfitting situation, it's fine to overfit. So this is, in a practical sense, this is the main implication. We don't have to be so careful about getting the best balance. We don't have to be so super careful about getting the exact lambda. This entire range of lambdas, this entire region on the on the Pareto frontier, is going to be just as good. Okay, um, okay. Um, let me end here. We're already almost ten minutes over time. Um, and um, just to summarize. Um, Mostly what I wanted to convey to you, we did talk also a bit about uh, uh, implicit regularization. There's you know, lots of more uh, to say, uh, but mostly what I wanted to, con uh, to, uh, to convey to you is really when we, we think about this is before jumping to conclusion of something, you know, we have to like throw away everything we had and start from scratch. You know, we actually learned quite a bit in like you know, several decades of uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, machine learning and statistical learning theory. And, most of uh, uh, um, the phenomena we, we see fit perfectly with, within our existing understanding. We know how to learn using overparameterized models. We know how you can get, you know, you can get complexity control from scale rather than uh, size. We know how it can come implicitly from the optimization algorithm. We just need to answer the questions of, okay, how does this actually play out in deep learning? What is the actual complexity control, you know, and how well does it correspond to reality? One thing that we definitely need to rethink, and we are rethinking, as evident by several talks this workshop, is, is uh, this uh, phenomenon of benign overfitting. It's not specific to deep learning. And we also, looking back, it was in front of our eyes, you know, at least since the 90s. And you can see it in these classic uh, uh, boosting results. I should say also it was in front of our, our eyes in those experiments from um, 
Um, you can even see the double descent there if you look carefully in the experiments from uh, uh, eight years ago, we were blind to it. Okay, so now I can say, you know, also I personally was blind to it. And so this phenomenon is not special specific to deep learning, but it is something that we, thanks to Misha, just kind of realized three years ago, uh, and really that, that or four years ago now, um, and it is something that we need to uh, uh, rethink and think about and, and see how that, and we definitely see it, especially in the context of deep learning. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Questions? Um, so I saw the, the part about um, using uniform convergence to explain benign overfitting. I was wondering in general, do you think that um, uniform convergence is still the right structure for, I mean, plus implicit bias is still the right structure for explaining generalization, oh. especially in light of, you know, kind of the result okay, that- Thanks for uh, it may reminding not be, me uh, I didn't put out the last bullet. Oh here, yeah, so well, that was my question. <laughs> Okay. That was my question. That's your question and my answer. <laughs> okay, uh, this was not planned, seriously. I mean, I said, thank you. <laughs> he planted um, me in the audience. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I'll uh, invite you to lunch after that. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, I'm not sure. So maybe, I definitely think that you can get quite away with the uh, uh, uniform convergence. So we, were, we are able, in fact, for specifically for benign overfitting, we can, uh, uh, we can explain much of it with, or with the um, uniform convergence. And in fact, it's also, so the other approaches are kind of these direct approaches to study specific method. Uh, we suggested using uniform convergence and then uh, others, including somebody that's here, I can't see her right now, uh, followed, uh, um, and this is a work by Fanny Yang and students. And I, oh, run your name? What? Constantine has work that also uses that for L1, uh, uh, minimum L1 on predictors. And this is the advantage of uniform convergence. And once we have this generic guarantee, we can plug it in into lots of different hypothesis classes, lots of different complexity measures. And then a lot can be gained from that. It's still not clear whether really we can explain everything we want using uniform convergence. I mean, there definitely you can construct synthetic situations in which you cannot. Okay, so we know the uniform convergence is not, so this is also work, uh, this, uh, to me, it was very surprising. We discovered this like already 10 years ago that actually there are things you can learn, but you can provably not learn them using uniform convergence. So in synthetic, there definitely exist synthetic situations like that. And I'm not sure how much of deep learning specifically we can explain with that or not. So both for benign overfitting and also, as I mentioned before, this complexity theory approach, breaking down things to saying, let's identify a complexity measure and now understand its capacity to you know, using uniform convergence tools. I, there are many things I know we can explain this way. I, I expect that there are many more things we can explain this way, but it's not clear whether it can really explain, you know, everything we want to explain or whether we have to go beyond that. So I guess a little bit more philosophically, do you think that we need a framework that can explain everything, even synthetic situations, or do you think it's sufficient that the framework can explain reality? Yes and yes. Uh -huh. So um, <laughs> as a, uh, it, it really varies. So if I, as a mathematician, in some sense, I feel like saying a mathematician is a bit uh, presumptuous. I, I want to understand learning also from a mathematical perspective. Like, I want to understand what are the minimal requirements for learning, like what learning is a mathematical phenomena. So if you want to understand learning as a mathematical phenomena, I'm definitely very interested in understanding all of the edge cases, you know, understanding when does uniform convergence provably fail, okay? Um, what other things, you know, can, is stability always sufficient? We don't know. Okay, is re, uh, you know uh, strict convexity in some sense always sufficient? I, I really am interested in that. <laughs> if I put on my engineering hat on and I want to understand deep learning, I think even engineer it's important to understand actually uh, uh, what you're doing. Then now, really, I should ask: Is you know, is uniform convergence or whatever other approaches sufficient for understanding this phenomena? I don't really care about the edge cases. Still, studying the edge cases is important because it like you know informs me about maybe I should be looking another way. But you know, the fact that there is an edge case doesn't mean that I should stop using uniform convergence because maybe I can get, you know, understand a lot of, of things with it, right? So it's, so I think both are important. Yeah. Uh, uniform convergence, <coughs> uh, uniform convergence uh, uh, In uniform convergence, we consider the training set is a random, random samples. Right. But in practice, we usually have a 
fix the training set. So is that a conflict? Uh, I don't know what it means to have a fixed training set. It doesn't make any sense for me to have a fixed training set. If you want to study learning, learning only, you know, you that training set, you know, came from somewhere you have to make some assumption about you have to you know not just assumption like you you have to have some relationship between your training set and what it is you're trying to predict you know it can be um saying that that training set was drawn from the same distribution as reality which is the assumption we make here you can also weaken that assumption either still stay within a probabilistic framework but like weaken the iid assumption of the fact that it's drawn from the same distribution or maybe the depart from the probabilistic framework uh, and talk about like something like online regret, right? So, so that's a different type of assumption about how your training data is related to what you're trying to predict. But you have to relate your training data to what you're trying to predict. It's meaningless to just say, I have a training set. I'm not going to assume anything about it. Let's see how running a training algorithm in that is going to work on something completely different. So I, I don't really know what it means to use a, a fixed training set. And, and this is, in particular, you know, so this is something that actually, I mean, I think important when you when you look at papers that when you look at when you uh, when you you think of your you 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 define your learning algorithm, the training set already fixed. It doesn't really make sense to me, right? The, the 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 training set is not part of the of the of the learning algorithm. Otherwise, what is a learning rule? Like to me, a learning rule is a mapping from the training set to you know to the predictors. It's not if the learning rule just outputs something constant. I don't know how how to think about it, how that makes sense. You know, if that answers your question, right? So, I mean, the way I think of it, reality, right? I mean, when you say you, learn, you use a fixed training set. So in reality, you don't use a fixed training set. You collect data, right? And you use that data. I mean, you, you, you have your learning rule before you collect the data, right? That's actually how you use. You write that when you're uh, doing writing papers in MNIST, then the training set is fixed. But writing train papers on the MNIST training set doesn't make any sense. Right? I mean, it's you, the only way it makes sense is if you think of the MNIST uh, data as sampled from somewhere, maybe. And in fact, also there you get maybe into some trouble because we're kind of way overfitting there. And is that maybe? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're defining overfitting as, as fitting noise, but what yeah. if it's not actually noise, it's just something that's. No, it's, it's, it's fitting noise. something. Yeah. So it's hard to have a mathematical definition of overfitting. Um, at least in, in the simple cases I have here where the data is generated by a predictor in the class plus noise, then I'm defining as fitting the noise. Generally, I define overfitting as fitting the part uh, of the data that cannot be, um, that you cannot, that goes beyond what you, uh, you, can, uh, you can fit beyond what you can explain using your effective uh, uh, hypothesis class, hypothesis class which have high enough capacity, right? This is a vague definition, right? So it's not like, um, I, I can't, uh, I, I don't, I, I can't write, I can't give a, a generic mathematical definition of overfitting and I don't, I'm not aware of anything like that. I don't think that's possible. But, but that, I think we have one final question. Sorry. Thank you. I was curious, do you have a sense of, uh, I'm like interested in like pack base versus uniform convergence, and do you have any sense of... Pack base is uniform convergence. It's, it's not uniform convergence in the sense that it gives you a bound on the expected risk of a distribution of classifiers rather than a, a worst case. It's uniform that. convergence. No, it is worst case. But it's worst pack case base, over... Pack base is uniform convergence. Pack base gives you... A, okay, so I'm not sure which why you're objecting to think of it here from convergence there might be two reasons and neither of them i think is uh maybe three reasons and, and none of them is okay so one thing is you get uh the your the predictors you're getting you're doing uniform convergence not over individual predictors but over aggregate predictors fine mm -hmm. that's still family of predictors it's still uniform convergence right. the second thing is um that the right hand side uh depends on the so you get a, a guarantee where the right hand side depends on the predictor but again, that's not, we, we saw that, that we get that, uh, uh, you know, it's the same way as saying, saying that I can get a, I'd still call that uniform convergence over uh, uh, low norm predictors where the right hand side depends on the norm, right? That's because I'm just looking at sub-level sets. Same thing in, with the pack base. I can rephrase in a completely equivalent statement to back base and saying, if the KL divergence is bounded, I get a guarantee with the right hand side is fixed. So that's still definitely uniform convergence. Maybe the third reason you're bothered by, and that's something I, I skipped here, is that the right-hand side also depends on the empirical, uh, on the empirical error. 
of the predictor. And again, that's uh, a very fairly standard thing. We're still calling it from convergence. Again, if, if you, uh, you know, the, in fact, the, if you open uh, any learning, all, all learning theory books I'm aware of, and all the good ones at least, uh, the first example they give you from convergence is a realizable case. They say, how do we uh, analyze, a, uh, get a, a learning guarantee in a realizable case with the, say finite cardinality? We take a union bound to get uniform convergence guarantee over zero, uh, uh, zero uh, training error predictors. So they're already putting the right hand side depends on the on the norm, on the error of the predictor. You can generalize it and have the right hand side depend in a more sophisticated way in the error of the predictor. That's still, from my perspective, uniform convergence guarantee. So I'm not sure which of these three bother you, but pack base is definitely uniform convergence guarantee. Well, I guess I would distinguish between a soup over a particular class or an, an average. And that, like a bound on the average error. Of a it's not a, huh? the bound is over the soup, not over the average. You spec base gives you you have a soup over all aggregations of predictors. It's definitely a soup. It's right, but but, but an aggregation of predictors can contain. But that's, a, that is said, the only the, it's uniform predict. It's uniform not over just over individual predictors, but it's uniform over aggregate predictors. But those aggregate predictors are just predictors, just a different class of predictors. It's like saying that you get. It's like saying that uniform convergence over linear predictors, it's not uniform because the predictors are not individual features, they're aggregate over features. That's exactly the same type of aggregation. Right. So it's it's definitely uniform convergence. Pack, pack base is definitely uniform convergence guarantee. I, 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 mean, I mean, I'm not sure. So sorry, what's bothering is the fact that you're, the predictors are aggregate? Okay, we should, we can take we this. So uh, offline, thanks. Uh, so I think we're resuming at 2.30. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Let's thank Nat again. Thanks.